Um, it's a great honor for me to start um, the Killam lecture session. Uh, I want to say a few words about the Killam um, Fund and the Killam lecture. The Killam lecture is funded by the Killam Fund to commemorate Peter Killam, a well-known limnologist who died in 1989 while doing field research in Africa. The Killam Fund was maintained all these years by a series of donations uh, by his wife, Sue Killam, a well-known limnologist on her own. Sue was professor at Drexel University where she and her students contributed to our understanding of ecological changes related to invasive species, uh, climate change, and the biology of tropical streams. Uh, unfortunately, Sukulam passed away in April this year. Uh, she was a dedicated SEAL member for many years, and this is an opportunity to say that we simply miss her. So Peter and Sue Killam are no longer with us, but thanks to Sue, the Killam Memorial Fund persists, and the Killam lectures are carefully chosen from a long list of candidates by the Sil Killam Memorial Committee. And it is a great honor to be elected as one of them. So it is a pleasure to be able to introduce to, the, to you today's Killam lecture, Dr. Susie Wood. And I want to say a few words about her. So Susie um, is in New Zealand. She completed her academic studies in Victoria University in Wellington. Um, she is a freshwater scientist and molecular ecologist based at the Cawthorne Institute in Nelson, New Zealand. Her research is multidisciplinary and integrative with the overarching goal of improving knowledge on freshwater ecosystems. She is passionate about her research and about protecting aquatic ecosystems. Her areas of expertise include toxin cyanobacteria, phytoplankton ecology, and the development and application of molecular techniques to, mo to monitor and understand aquatic system, um, and also paleolimnology. Susie is the co-program leader of a large project known as Our Lakes Health, Past, Present, and Future. This project aims to enrich knowledge on the environmental, societal, and cultural histories of New, Ze New Zealand lakes, and I have some feedbacks that this is an amazing project. She's also a key research in a program called Eye on Lakes, National Monitoring of Cyanobacterial Blooms, which aims to develop remote sensing methods to enhance uh, cyanobacterial bloom management. Her recent research on benthic cyanobacteria is considered groundbreaking. She was twice in Antarctica to study an, uh, Antarctic microorganisms. In addition to being a great scientist, she's also a great sports person, a competitive cyclist that has represented New Zealand in the World Cup in 2006, and since then she's participated in many cycling and triathlon competitions. Uh, sports give us scientists additional tools to deal with stress, conflicts, deadlines, competition. All the above makes Susie an excellent role model, special uh, a uh, role model, especially for young women scientists. And Susie, the floor is yours. I think I'm, I'm all mic'd up. Thanks, Tamara. Thank you. Cool. Uh, thank you for the very kind uh, introduction, Tamara. And yeah, thank you to the Society for this award. I, I feel very humbled and honoured to receive this. Um, especially in the 100th year, and it's really special to have had you intro introduce me to Ma. You're an amazing woman and an incredible scientist and just a fantastic um, role model for us all. Um, let me just check if it's going to work. So, um, yeah, um, today, as Tamar said, I'm a, I guess I'm a freshwater scientist, molecular ecologist, and my real passion in my work is understanding, protecting, and preserving New Zealand's freshwater environments. And really, I love, working on, I love working on lakes. And so I'm going to be talking to you about a project that I've been co-leading for around about the last four years. Um, but I'm going to start with probably the, the three most important slides of my talk and just a little um, quote to get us started. 
So sometimes the most extraordinary things are achievable simply by doing them with the right people. So I just wanted to acknowledge the Lakes 380 team. They're a team of amazing, humble, talented, and extraordinarily passionate researchers. And the work I present today is, um, is their collection of many hundreds or thousands of, of their talented hours. Um, I also wanted to acknowledge my New Zealand Lake heroes. Um, and so many of you will know Professor Carolyn Burns. So she's the only female president of the SIL in the last 100 years. Um, she, she was president between two, uh, sorry, 1995 and 2001. And last year she received a knighthood. And so this is the highest honour that can be awarded to anybody in New Zealand. And it's the only example of an environmental scientist receiving this honour in New Zealand. And it's just amazing um, that someone that's so passionate and such a, an amazing advocate for lakes um, is here in New Zealand with us. Um, so Professor David Hamilton. So I was fortunate um, to have David as a mentor during my postdoc and have worked on, on many um, great projects with him since then. Um, and you're going to hear more about from him shortly. Um, yeah, but I just wanted to acknowledge the so we've lent David to Australia for a few years, um, but I just want to acknowledge the contribution that David's made to New Zealand freshwater research and continues to make, um, both through still working on our lakes and rivers, but also through his, um, sci uh, sorry, his researchers and students that he mentored and, and supervised, and many of them now hold really key positions in our freshwater management. Um, so one of the things I was privileged, or had the privilege of doing over the last few years is um, working with Professor um, Carolyn Burns and co-supervising um, Dr. Lena Schallenberg through her PhD. And when you work with someone like Lena, you don't really supervise, um, you, learn, you learn with them. And I think Lena to me represents what I've seen so much of this week with our early career scientists, you know, these really talented, um, tenacious researchers that absolutely want their research to make a difference. And so I feel like our, our fresh water is in, is in good hands. And um, as Tamar said, I just wanted to acknowledge um, the Peter, Dr. Peter and Susan Kalam who make this ward um, possible. And so when I heard I was receiving this ward, it was a really nice journey for me to go on and to, to read more about their research and learn about their fantastic work, and particularly on um, the African lakes, and to find areas of, of common interest. So in particular around phytoplankton ecology and, and an interest in paleolimnology. And so I hope that um, in some small way the work that I present um, continues their legacy. So I want to start with a very quick introduction into my homeland, Aotearoa, New Zealand. So we're a really small nation down in the southwest Pacific. We're one of the youngest countries in the world to be settled, so humans only arrived around about 750 um, years ago. But we've been isolated as a landmass for about 80 million years. And in particular, we have no mammals, or except for a few small species of, of bat. This has allowed a really unique flora and fauna to develop. And there I've, I've shown some of our charismatic um, flightless birds. But we also have a wonderful um, freshwater flora and fauna. And of course, what I'm going to talk to you today about is our, our wonderful lakes. So we have 3,800 lakes in Aotearoa, New Zealand, that are greater than one hectare in size. And these lakes are diverse in every way imaginable. So from our small urban lakes, to large lakes and highly agricultural catchments, to our absolute gems of, of alpine tarns up in the mountains. And these lakes have been created by volcanic eruptions, landslides from earthquakes, um, glacial retreat, and much more. And so you'd think with such a, a rich, um, so really we're a small country, but we have this amazingly rich um, diversity of lakes and types of lakes. And so you'd we think with this that we'd have an equally enriched scientific knowledge. So this map here shows the lakes that we, we currently monitor or have monitoring data for. And this is less than 5%. And these lakes are, are primarily in lowland, highly modified catchments. And when we have monitoring records, they only span one or two decades. So there's no information on what these lakes were like prior to human arrival. And this is challenging, of course, when we're trying to think about restoration and setting realistic restoration targets. Um, if you look at the, those orange dots, you'll also see that they're not very well spatially distributed. And so there's vast regions of New Zealand's lakes that we have no monitoring data for. And just to draw your attention to one particular region down on the, the South Island there, um, I guess it's on, on your left-hand side. So this is Fiordland National Park, over 900 primarily alpine lakes that next, we have next to no data on. 
So this lack of data um, prompted my colleagues and I to um, come up with a proposal um, that was fortunately funded called Our Lakes Health Past, Present and Future, also known as, as Lakes 380. And um, it's a fairly ambitious project, both scientifically and logistically, and what we set out to do was to sample 10% of New Zealand's lakes, but also to learn about their cultural and um, social history. I just wanted to acknowledge my co-leader on this project, Marcus van der Goes, who's a really fantastic colleague and, and really great friend. And so when we, when we arrive at a lake, we're taking surface water um, and surface sediment samples, and also um, collecting a suite of very, um, different physical chemical parameters. And so this is to characterize the current health and biodiversity of our lakes. And we're also taking sediment cores. Um, so as, all, as you're all aware, that sediment cores allow us to understand if our lakes have changed and how and why and when. And so we've, um, in the final year of our project, um, and we we're pretty close to achieving our goal of sampling 10% of, of our lakes. And, and this just shows that the spatial um, distribution of these lakes. And one thing that was really important with our sampling plan is that um, it was extremely representative of all lakes um, lakes and lake types and all sorts of different environmental ingredients. And we even managed to get out to some of our offshore islands to sample lakes out there. And so we've generated literally hundreds of thousands of, of samples, and these are often been analysed at various different laboratories around the country. And our cultural and, and social teams have been interviewing and filming and, and producing documentaries, and, and I'll point to a few of these later on. And there's been many different um, outputs produced. So I'm just going to give you a really a little glimpse of Lakes 380 today, um, and I've just picked three areas to highlight to you. So one of these is, is the work that we've been doing on the current health of New Zealand, trying to understand how healthy our, our lakes are nationally. And then I want to take you on a trip back in time using our sediment cores and show you how we're using this data to think about restoration. And by the time I get to this point in my talk, I feel like you're all going to be feeling pretty gloomy. So I want to finish, um, hopefully, with something that shows you there is a brighter way forward and you know, there is some positivity looking ahead. OK, so when we, when we think about um, the way that we currently measure water quality or trophic status in lakes, we go out to the middle of the lake, we take a water sample, we measure nutrients and, and algae, and, and of course um, we have to do this um, reasonably regularly, in New Zealand at least monthly, for three or five years to, to establish what trophic state that lake's in. And while that generates a, a huge amount of really valuable data, of course, we can't possibly do that on all lakes in New Zealand, and that's um, really limiting the amount of lakes that we can monitor. Um, and especially when we've got alpine lakes that are in remote ne regions that we have to helicopter out to. So our first challenge that we wanted to um, take on was to try and develop the lakes, the 300 lakes that we'd sampled, and start to get a really um, pretty nice picture of where the different lakes were distributed in New Zealand and their different trophic condition. And then we've wanted to take this further, and so we've used um, machine learning to now estimate the health of all lakes, or all 3,800 lakes in New Zealand. And remember, we're doing this now with a highly representative data set. So this next figure here um, shows the, the health of our lakes and the distribution of those lakes across the country. And so what we find is that 45% of our lakes are eutrophic or worse. Now I, can, I hear a few, hmm, I'm not sure what that means, whether people are, uh, um, think that's good or bad, but um, I guess when I've been presenting this or talking to people about this in New Zealand um, the last month or so, I've been really surprised that no one seems too alarmed at this number, and uh, perhaps it's above... We've, above 50%, so we're not too worried. So this is really alarming to me, and I've wanted to think about how I could show this data in a different way to really show that our lakes are at crisis point. So what I've done now is, is taken that data and grouped it by region. So in New Zealand, we have 16 regional management units, if you like, regional organisations that manage the environment. 
what we see when we group the data like this is if you're in the North Island, 80% of our lakes are in poor or worse condition, so eutrophic or worse. And this is largely, of course, related to the, the higher levels of agriculture and land use in the North Island. But if we zoom in even further into some of those regions, it's actually over 90%. And if we stop and think about what that means, it's that you know, one in ten, only one in 10 lakes that we visit are going to be in a good condition, and almost certainly during some of those other nine lakes are going to have cyanobacterial blooms, not be safe for swimming, harvesting food, or, or you know, the impacts on our aquatic organisms are going to be very substantial. But I don't think New Zealanders have, have quite grasped what this means and really the challenges that lie ahead for us. So just to, to show you this, what I've done now is zoom in on one region in New Zealand, um, the Manawatu Whanganui region. This is a region at the, the lower um, North Island. It's about 20 times larger than um, Berlin, but it's very sparsely populated. So there's lot of, not a lot of money for uh, restoration or freshwater restoration. There are 228 lakes in this region, and based on our current government policy, they fail, 70 of those fail the national bottom line. So 70 of those are supertrophic or worse. And what that means is that the, the regional management authorities, authorities are going to have to work with communities and indigenous populations to come up with action plans. And if we think about it, a country where most of our problems are caused by diffuse pollution, this is very expensive. So these restoration plans are multi-million dollar programs, and they're also multi-generational. And when we look at restoration success in New Zealand, there's not a single example of successful restoration that hasn't got some sort of ongoing human intervention. And so I guess this, this really got us, um, and as part of the Lakes 380 project, thinking about um, how we could improve restoration success. And, and what we asked ourselves was if we could listen to our lakes and if we could hear their stories, perhaps we could understand how and why they've changed and we could improve restoration success. So what I want to do now is, is take you on a trip back on time to look at some of the sediment core data and, and how we're using that. And to start with, I just want to remind you of the um, human occupation and the arrival of humans in New Zealand and the impact that that had on our landscape. So prior to um, human occupation, which started around about 750 years ago, 85% of our country was covered in native vegetation. So our lakes would have been surrounded by amazing forests. And the regions that aren't in forest are, are largely alpine or volcanic. And 750 years ago, as, as the Māori, the um, indigenous people of New Zealand, arrived, they started to burn the landscape. And some of this was accidental, and, and some of this was um, on purpose for horticulture and also for defence, so that they could see rival tribes coming across the landscape. And so I guess at the end of the, what we call the Māori occupation phase, um, the forest had re been reduced to around about 50%, so about 30% of our natural vegetation had been removed. But I really wanted to emphasise that the, the Māori world view, so te ara Māori, um, is one that Māori are part of the environment and the environment is part of them. So they were incredible environmentalists, if you like, and they lived in a very sustainable way. So while undoubtedly they had um, some impact on our, our fresh waters, it was relatively min minimal. <clears throat> Okay, so around 200 years ago, Europeans arrive in New Zealand and they, they continue the burning and they also log more of our forests um, as part of a native timber trade. And if we look at how much vegetation or native forests left now, it's around about 25%. But we didn't stop there. Of course, we built houses and cities and we replaced our native forests with pine plantations and we introduced um, perch and trout and rudd and all sorts of other um, and non-native fish to make our, our freshwater systems more like um, Britain and Europe. And then more recently, um, land use has intensified, and in particular, that, um, started to fertilise our, our catchments. So I just want to keep that, you to keep that in mind, because I'm going to be referring to those, those three phases as I go through the next few slides. Okay, so the first lake I want to take you to is Lake Ponui. It's a small lake at the bottom of, of the um, North Island. It's quite a special lake in that it's one of our only lowland lakes in the North Island that still has a large proportion of its catchment and native vegetation. And it was considered a clear water lake until sort of 15 years ago, but the water quality has deteriorated really quickly and it now experiences um, severe cyanobacterial blooms. I'm just going to show you a small part of the data that we've generated for this lake. 
So to orientate you, um, I've got the sediment core from this lake laid horizontally in those three different time periods, and we're looking at about a thousand years of history here. And this data here is that the surface bacterial index that I introduced earlier, but we've applied that down the core, so we can look at how trophic level has changed over a thousand years. So prior to European arrival, um, this lake was mesotrophic or ogliotrophic, but shortly after European arrival, the water quality started to deteriorate rapidly, and this lake is now hypertrophic or supertrophic or hypertrophic. And there's a whole suite of, of data that sits behind this, which I'm not going to show you, but it really points to the evidence that the introduction of European perch was the initial driver of change in this lake. But I want to highlight one uh, other piece of information that we have got for this lake, and it's, I guess it's a fairly new area still in paleolimnology, and it's really allowing us to start to look at the biodiversity or the historic biodiversity of our lakes in a, in a way that hasn't previously been possible. So this is the application of, of eDNA to our sediment cores, and there was a great session uh, earlier in the conference on this. And I've just simplified this down just to highlight some of the amazing things that we can start to now pull out of our sediment cores. So here, um, what we find is that prior to European arrival, this lake was full of an amazing diversity of freshwater sponges and green algae and, and native macrophytes. Um, and after European arrival, we see almost the complete loss of these communities, which are replaced by ogliochaetes and, and nematodes and diatoms that are um, typically found with nutrient-enriched conditions and more recently, cyanobacteria. Um, and just to mention, this is the great work of, of Mylies, who's a um, PhD student who's here. And so when we think about restoration, we often think mostly about restoring water quality, but I think what this is now going to allow us to do is actually think about restoring whole ecosystems. And we typically, in paleolimnology, think about how, we, how ecosystems are deconstructed, but what if we could think about how we reconstruct all of those different components, and, and would that improve restoration success? Okay, so the second lake I wanted to take you to is Lake Rototoa, or Ototoa. Um, it's right up in the, in the north of New Zealand. It's an incredibly culturally significant lake. Um, it's a large dune lake. Um, it's, all, it's really one of the only lakes in this whole region that is still in, in reasonably good condition. And it's got a long history of pine plantation in its catchment, and also agricultural land use. But, but you might have noticed that it still has a, a reasonable um, strip of native vegetation around it. So the water quality of this lake is declining. And the, the regional managers asked us to try and establish what was the drivers of this. And, and they really believed it was introduced fish that was the key, um, the key starter or the initiation of, of the water to quality decline. So when we look at our data, um, just to orientate you again, we've got the, the sediment core lying horizontally. And I'm just, I've just pulled out the European period for this slide. And I've le selected three of the different proxies that we use. So one are diatom communities, the other are our bacterial communities, and then chlorophyll A is measured by um, HPLC. And so those top two are multivariant data. So we've used a principal response curve to bring that down to univariant data. And these are um, general, general, or GAMS, sorry, GAMS plots. And so when you see a, um, an increase uh, sorry, when you see a blue or red line, that represents a significant change in that proxy. And there's a pretty well-documented um, record of the fish introductions into this lake, so this allows us to, to have a look at this in more detail. So rainbow trout were introduced in 1912, but what we see is that, at least in the 20 years post their introduction, we don't see any decline in water quality. Um, and rudd and tench were introduced in 1970, and perch uh, around about 1999. But if we look at the introduction of them, that's actually after the, um, the change in, in several of these proxies has started to, um, started to change. So while I don't doubt that they're contributing to the decline of water quality and lake health, they don't seem to be the initial trigger. So if we look at land use change, so there's, there's a... a sort of history from the 1860s of, of farming in this catchment, but it's not till 1940 when we, we know that the fertilisation of the catchment began. And this aligns really nicely with when we start to see the, the change, the significant change um, in these different proxies. And in 1974, pine plantation started, and they started to fertilise uh, with nitrogen-enriched fertiliser. And this corresponds to when we see changes in the diatoms, and particularly these ones that are... Um, that respond to nitrogen. 
So fairly compelling evidence that at least the initial trigger for changes in this lake were caused by nitrogen and phosphorus fertilisation. So I've, I've given you a, a couple of case studies, and I guess what we've found is that every lake has its own unique story, and that there is huge value in understanding um, the history of lakes, and especially when we're thinking forward as to how they might be managed. But what about when we combine all of this data at a national level? So how do our alpine lakes compare to our lowland lakes? And what does that start to look like? So I'm just gonna, I've just picked one, um, one bit of data to show you to start with, and this is um, it's from our environmental DNA, our bacterial communities, and we found that they're amazing um, indicators of change, and they align very well with traditional proxies. And I'm going to show you a PCOA plot. Hopefully. Here we go. So just to orientate you, the three different colours there represent the different time periods of human occupation that I introduced you to. To remind you, our sediment cores pre-human go somewhere between 500 to 6,000, um, cover 500 to 6,000 years of time. Um, that Maori phase is around about 550, and the European is only 200 years. And I should have said this is data from now about 130 different lakes. And so two things I want to draw your attention to is that um, in the Maori and um, pre-human period, while there is some change, it's nowhere near the order of magnitude of change that we see over that 200-year period. So across that green area there, there's just a huge, a huge change occurring. And then hopefully you can all see that there's this incredible trend of homogenization, and so we're losing diversity and our communities are becoming more homogenous. And this is happening regardless of lake type, so whether it's a large lowland lake or a high alpine lake. So the same data plotted here, but I've just colored it by tro current trophic level. Um, and so this really, I guess, suggests that while we've got local selective pressures occurring at a lo le local level, there are also global drivers that are changing our lakes. And we don't know as yet, this is sort of a subject of ongoing investigation to explore further what these are. And so, yeah, when I look at this graph, it makes me incredibly sad and incredibly worried for the future, because almost certainly a lack of diversity means a lack of resilience and a lack of resistance, and, and we know the world is going to be um, filled with more disturbance events. And I, I look at it and I wonder what we've done to our lakes in, in 200 short years, how we could have allowed our lakes to change this much. Okay, so that's the end of the gloom. <laughs> I promised I was going to finish with a brighter note. So I think one of the things we thought about this project that would be such a privilege and it, it was to go and work with these lakes and to visit these lakes. It was an absolute amazing opportunity to see such a, an amazing array of lakes. But what was equally um, as rewarding and significant and important was the people that we met that had long associations or were incredibly passionate about these lakes. And that includes both our indigenous people and, and many of the community groups and they had this real hunger for knowledge and a real sense of wanting to make a difference. And so this has become a really important part of this project. And, and here's some images from knowledge sharing days that we held um, in each of the regions or each of the lakes that we went to. And so I just wanted to highlight a couple of ways that um, we've been working with, with these people um, and working with communities to, um, yeah, to, to educate and to, to change. And I guess if we think about how we're going to change our lakes in New Zealand, we actually need to bring people with us and change societal attitudes as well. So Mataranga Māori, or Indigenous Knowledge. Um, so Māori have a long association and affiliation with our lakes. And we were really fortunate to work with four iwi, or, or tribes, in different regions of New Zealand, and develop relationships and learn about... Um, their affiliations, their associations with the lakes, and their, their knowledge. And then we were trying to think of ways to, um, I guess, to, to allow other people an insight into this and, and also to weave the different knowledge streams, so to weave indigenous knowledge with our biophysical data. And so one way we've done that is through a digital storytelling, um, digital storytelling portal. And so on that website there, there's um, sort of 30 or 40 documentaries and short films that capture these different um, knowledges and also some of the weaving of knowledges that we've been doing. So the other space that we've been thinking a lot about is science communication. And so I just picked out one example to show you. Um, and this example was 
um, carried out in collaboration with Ngāti Kawata, who are an indigenous community, and our Department of Conservation. And really importantly, it weaves these different knowledge streams. So it's a, it's a virtual reality platform and allows users to travel backwards and forwards in time and see how the impacts on the landscape have also affected the lake. And very importantly, it also allows us to visualise the future. So I've just got a very short um, video to, to show you um, this. So we're starting um, in the present day world and you can just see that the catchment has been um, deforested essentially. And if we dive down under the water, you'll see that it's a completely barren life um, landscape, nearly devoid of all life. But if we're now to go back a thousand years in time before any humans arrived in this, we just see what an absolute gem of a place it would have been and absolutely how beautiful it was. And if you dive down under the water, you'll see that it's absolutely teeming with life. Um, a huge number of native fish and native vegetation. And then we come forward to when uh, Māori occupied occupied this region, and we've captured the, um, the knowledge, the indigenous knowledge, by talking to the local tribe um, through videos and also through touch points, which allow you to understand more about the cultural and biological um, history of this lake. And here we're looking at the 100-year vision for this lake. So this is Ngāti Kawata's 100-year vision. And I think this is, this is incredibly important because many of the people involved in the restoration will not be around to see see what this lake looks like by the time it's healthy. So if we allow them to, to visualise this, you know, it helps inspire them um, in, the, in the path of restoration. Cool, so a brighter future. Um, yeah, so I, I don't pretend to have any answers about what a brighter future looks like, but yeah, certainly when I look around this audience, I know that many of you have the pieces of the puzzle, or many pieces of the puzzle. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to finish. We have a whakatoki or proverb. Um, for Lakes 380. Um, so current and future activities should be guided by lessons from the past. And while you sit and contemplate that for a moment, I've got a, a short video that just shows some of the adventures that we had as part of Lakes 380. Willing to 
change, I just don't know how. But I hit rock bottom, so I start right. Voices whisper that I'm not to blame. They say everyone's afraid of change. Sounds to me like they've given up, but they don't know the heart of God. I'm willing to change, I just don't know how. So I think we need to change the last line of that song to I'm willing to change, and the time is right now. So thank you very much for listening, and yeah, please never stop what you're doing. It's so incredibly important. Thank you. What an inspiring lecture, Susie. The room is open for questions. Yes, over there. Is it on? Yeah. Wow. Your video almost made me cry. (laughs) That was really nice. And I was wondering, do you think that this kind of approach uh, is useful for uh, motivating people to actually start restoring and helping? Because I'm actually from the Netherlands, and we have a huge nitrogen crisis going on now, and we get a lot of anger from people that, um, yeah, from the farmers uh, when we take measures against more nitrogen emissions. So my question is, do you think that this is a useful approach in engaging people, also farmers? Yeah, absolutely. Um, We need to bring people with us on these journeys if we're going to successfully restore our lakes. And, you know, a big part of our project was actually getting permission to access these lakes. And so we had very similar conversations with the farmers, the landowners, because they were often nervous that we were coming to sample their lake to blame them but um, by the, once you sat down and had the conversation with them and showed them that you know it wasn't we weren't trying to blame them that this was a problem that we had to collectively solve um, you know you really changed their attitudes and so yeah I think it's I think it's about education um, and engagement as well. So you started with just conversations or did you also have this kind of uh, videos to <laughs> engage people? <laughs> we started with conversations and one thing that we found was that um, especially when we held these knowledge days before and we'd split the sediment core open, that that was an incredible educational tool because you can literally see the points in time when the, this lake, these lakes have, have changed. And for people to look back and see how um, actions have changed lakes was incredibly powerful. But yes, I think these tools would be, I think, you know, being able to visualise into the future is, is incredibly um, valuable. Okay, thank you. There's another question here. Here. I, I should have put in some more effort, sorry. Um, yeah, thank you for a very inspirational talk. Um, coincidentally, I'm also from the Netherlands, but my question is about something else. I was wondering um, if you talk about restoration, I know that there's a lot of debate now also in the Netherlands about giving rights to water bodies or ecosystems, giving them... Um, Um, legal rights and I know that there's a very um, famous 
example from New Zealand, from a river system, and I was wondering if you think something like that would also be applicable to lakes in the future. Yeah, so that the Whanganui River is being given the rights of a, I guess essentially the rights of a person. Um, yeah, absolutely. And I don't think we're too far off um, that happening for a couple of lakes in New Zealand. Yeah, and absolutely it raises their, raises their level of importance, I guess, in society. And Yeah. Yes, there in the back. Thank you very much. Uh, it seems you have a large combination of potential disturbances of your catchment or on your lakes. So when it's about restoration, I guess you have to provide or to target an action to help people doing it. So when the problem is coming from perch introduction dating back from 200 years ago, what would you recommend? <laughs> Yeah, um, good question. It's obviously really hard because why perch might have triggered the initial decline, there's now a whole lot of negative feedback loops that are uh, um, occurring in that lake, and so we've got nutrient enrichment and internal nutrient cycling, and, and so I think it's, it's also about compi um, combining this historical data with modern monitoring data, which is a, you know, super important to understand. Um, so we couldn't just remove perch and expect that lake to return to normal now. Yes, go ahead. Oh. Yeah, you can be next. Thank you. Um, as for the first uh, question here, I was also very touched by this video. I felt like crying almost. Mm -hmm. So thank you for really providing also inspiration for our hearts and not only for our brains. Mm -hmm. My question is about nitrogen fertilization of forests mm -hmm. and the future concerning bioeconomic development to substitute fossil fuels with renewable resources for food and fodder and fiber and biofuels. Um, we have a great pressure now in Europe to go in that direction and I'm asking whether it's the same in the New Zealand and how you would see that um, development affecting the lakes and whether you see some hope that we can counteract the possible negative effects of forest fertilization mm -hmm. on our lands. Yeah, so that there are similar sort of moves afoot in New Zealand. There's also some really, um, I think, inspiring moves in place. And so one, one that I heard of recently was... Um, uh, a movement to, if we were to, if we could invest in removing predators. So in New Zealand, um, we have a lot of browsers that have come in and, and removed native understory vegetation. And actually, if we could remove those browsers and, and let that native vegetation come back, then there might be an opportunity to get carbon credits for that. So I think we're starting to um, think in new, new and innovative ways in that space, which could have really positive conservation um, effects as well. But yeah, absolutely. Yeah something to think about and concerns. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I think this is going to be the last question on your right. Uh, my question also goes towards restoration, although I'm not from the Netherlands. <laughs> um, it, 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 you, you, you didn't say it explicitly, but it sounded as if the basic concept is when you turn back deforestation and replant forest that you get the lakes healthy is that right or and what is the potential you think you can achieve given the fact that of course land use is also under conflict say the farmers of course want to farm and so on so yeah restoration is by no means that that simple it's not not anywhere near as simple as um reforesting the catchments and um, of course, there's a legacy of, of nutrients in many of these lakes, and there's also invasive species, and so, yeah, restoration is, is incredibly complex, and multi, you know, this is why we talk about multi-generational projects, and so we learn from the past, but we also need current monitoring data and, and many of the other tools that people have talked about here to actually successfully plan um, restoration projects. Thank you very much, thank you. Susie, and thank you very much, everybody. Oh.